Now let's continue on and solve the mystery as God reveals the answer. And it wasn't definitively written down until John wrote it down in what is Revelation 20. Now let's look at those in the first resurrection. Now there are different places that talk about the first resurrection. Those who are raised to life at the return of Christ and all of that. And we know that Paul wrote this. He said, Christ the first fruit, and those who are his at his coming. Now that means all of those who will be in the first resurrection. So let's read another example of it here, Revelation 20 and verse 4. And John writes, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who did not worship the beast or his image and did not receive the mark in their foreheads or in their hands and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now notice this parenthetical statement in verse 5. We can understand verse 4. There are many scriptures which help us understand it and realize that this takes place at the first resurrection. But notice verse 5, this parenthetical statement, but the rest of the dead do not live again until the thousand years were completed. Now that's quite a statement, isn't it? Then it refers back to verse 4. This is the first resurrection. Now stop and think about this for a minute and combine it together. This is the first resurrection. Now if it's the first, that tells us there's more than one. Because if there was only one resurrection, it would say, and this is the resurrection. But it says this is the first resurrection. But go back and read the first part of verse 5 again. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were completed. Now, if they live again, what is that? That is a resurrection, another resurrection, right? And we can call this the second resurrection. Resurrection, it says the rest of the dead. That's all the good, the evil, etc. Okay? Do not live again until the thousand years are completed. That includes what? All of those killed in wars and accidents and, and uh, shipwrecks and every kind of evil and human sacrifice, and everyone that was not in the first resurrection. Now, what did Jesus say in John 5? Some to life and some to condemnation. Now, what is condemnation? Condemnation, as we will see, is the lake of fire. So let's continue on right here in verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and the one who was sitting on it, from whom the face of the earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. That is, for them, the rest of the dead. Okay. And I saw the dead. There you have it small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. Well, 
two books were open. Okay? The first set were open. The books were open, which is what? That has to be the Word of God. So they can be taught the Word of God. We'll see that in a little bit. Okay? And the Book of Life was open, meaning they were given an opportunity to receive eternal life. Are given, will be given. Let's put it that way. That's more accurate because it hasn't occurred yet. Okay? Now then, then it talks about, and it says, and the dead were judged in the things written in the books according to their works. Well, if they lived their life and died, then everything they did up to the point of death now can be set aside. Okay. Now they're going to be judged by the standard of God's word for eternal life. Now who are these dead? These are all of those who did not commit the unpardonable sin. Let's see how Jesus makes a distinction of this in Matthew 12. So let's come here. So this helps us to understand. Now that one phrase... That one sentence, the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were completed, is the key that unlocks the scriptures that we're going to read in Matthew 12, and as we will see a little later in, in the book of Ezekiel. But here, Matthew 12. This is quite interesting when you put it all together, you see. This is why in understanding these things, it's a little here, it's a little there, and we rightly divide the word of God to come up with the truth. Okay, chapter 12, verse 30. Matthew 12 and verse 30. The one who is not with me is against me, and the one who does not gather with me scatters. Because of this I say to you, Every sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven to men except the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. That shall not be forgiven to men. Why? Because this shows that once this is the Holy Spirit from God the Father, and that shows that these people have rejected the Spirit of God, rejected the truth, would not repent. Those are the ones who are not found written in the book of life that will be cast into the lake of fire, Revelation 20, as we just read. Now let's read on, verse 32. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this age nor in the coming age. Did you get that? The coming age is what? The time after the millennium. And that period of the great white throne judgment is going to follow the same pattern that we saw during the millennium. These people will be raised to life. So many. There's hardly any room for them. Just think what's going to have to happen for those toward the end of the millennium to prepare for this second resurrection. See? They're going to be raised from the dead. All who have died those who are untimely deaths, and even those that have been aborted. And the reason is this. At conception, everything that a person is is already locked into the genes and chromosomes. And the only difference between that and a full-grown human being is growth. That's it. Do you think that God is going to give Satan one single victory? 
Of course not. So God is able to resurrect them. How will he resurrect them? I think it will be like full-term infants. Now, where there be a lot of people around to take care of them, there will be plenty of people. And for those poor mothers who had their children aborted, they will have their children given to them. So they can take care of them. Now think about undoing one of the greatest evils of all. And only God can do that, you see. That's why this is such a fantastic and tremendous day and is called the last great day. And it is. Think about that. Okay? Now let's go on. It shall not be forgiven him neither in this age nor in the coming age. So you have those who are wicked, who will not repent. They will be destined to the lake of fire. Okay? So then he says, either make the tree good and so forth. Come down here to verse 36. But I say to you that every idle word that men may speak, they shall be held accountable in the day of judgment. And the second resurrection is their day of judgment. Now think of the repentance that's going to take place with all of these people. Because they will recognize that here we have life. Look at all the sons of God who are here to help us. And Christ and in the knowledge of God the Father. And we will teach them, and we will help them, and they will overcome. What about all of those who died in the atomic blast in Nagasaki and Hiroshima? What about all of those who were fighting in wars and their heads lopped off or their brains shot out or whatever? What about all of those who were killed in, in ritual sacrifice? Amazing. All of those who died in the flood. All of those who died in earthquakes and floods and different disasters. You name the disaster. They'll be resurrected back to a physical life. We will see that in just a little bit. Then some of the scribes wanted a sign. He didn't give it. Then he says here, verse 40. For just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, in like manner the Son of Man shall be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. The men of Nineveh shall stand up, that means resurrected, in the judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it because they repented at the proclamation of Jonah, and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Quite an amazing thing, isn't it? So think about this great white throne judgment. How fantastic that this is going to be. Now then, let's come to Ezekiel 37 and let's see how all Israel shall be saved. Quite a phenomenal thing indeed. Now, you cannot understand the timing of Ezekiel 37 without the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation tells us when this is going to be applied. And also, you need to understand the principle because Jesus said that the men of Nineveh, who were Gentiles, shall be raised in the judgment with them. So as we read Ezekiel 37, know that this is going to happen 
to all people from all nations down through all time, regardless of when it was. Now then, once they are raised and they are given the books to know and understand how to receive eternal life, then they will be able to understand about Jesus. They will be able to repent. They will be able to be baptized and receive the Holy Spirit and live that 100 years so they likewise can enter into the kingdom of God as spirit beings. Because remember where we started, in the beginning, right? Well, let's see how God is going to solve all the problems of death in the world. Death for those who did not commit the unpardonable sin. Those who sinned greatly, very greatly. Yes, indeed. But stop and think for just a minute. Remember Ahab, king of Israel? He was called most wicked. And God sent Elijah to tell him, you're going to die. Well, what did Ahab do? Hey, he repented, put on sackcloth, and walked tenderly. Then God said to Elijah, go back and see my servant Ahab, how he's repented. Now then, think about Manasseh and his great sin. And he repented. So think about what it's going to be with all people in their lives. There are going to be some with a great number of sins. There are going to be some with just what you might say ordinary sins of living, but not having the commandments of God nor knowledge of salvation. And as Paul said, those who do the things contained in the law are a law unto themselves. So there will be a lot of those people. And the ones that I think are going to be the most surprised of all will be the Protestants because they think they are so close to having salvation and that they're all going to go to heaven. And what a surprise it's going to be for them when they are raised from the dead and their physical being again. All right, Ezekiel 37, verse 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me and brought me by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of a valley, and it was full of bones, a great valley. And it made me walk among them all around. Now, Ezekiel, go down and walk in there, okay? I want you to look at all of that. All those bones, all those leg bones and heads and, and skulls, and all of that, okay? And behold, very many were in the open valley, and they were very dry, showing they had been dead a long, long time. You can see that in some of the excavations that they do in various places of the world. They find skulls, they find leg bones, they find whole skeletons, and everything. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? Well, he's looking at all these bones, and God says, Hey, Ezekiel, you think they can live? And I answered, Oh, Lord God, you know. <laughs> In other words, don't ask me. I couldn't tell you, Lord. You know. Again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. Now we're going to see this is the resurrection to a second physical life. This doesn't have anything to do with eternal life yet. 
but Revelation 20 shows us that their names will be written in the book of life if they do the rest of what the New Testament shows, repent and are baptized and grow in grace and knowledge. And they will have every opportunity to do this and will be there to do it. Okay? I will lay send you on you and will bring flesh upon you and cover you with skin, put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. What was it that the children of Israel didn't know, even though they were God's people? Very few knew the Lord. Why? Because they got carried away with Baalism. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking. And the bones came together, a bone to its bone. You know, we can have that in movies today. You know, all the parts come back together. Okay? And as I watched, behold, sinew and flesh came upon them. This was astonishing. And skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. So here's a whole valley full of rejuvenated corpses. And he said to me, prophesy to the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. Imagine the eye-popping expression on Ezekiel's face. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet an exceeding great army. Sound a lot like Revelation 20? Yes, indeed. And he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Now stop and think about that. Paul wrote that all Israel shall be saved. And even though this was available to him, he didn't even mention it, but he knew somehow that this is going to happen. But he didn't know anything about the second resurrection. Okay. Behold, they say, our bones are dried and our hope is lost, and we ourselves are completely cut off. Why? Because of their sins. Did not God blind them? Did not God say he didn't want them to understand at the time of Christ? Yes. Well, go back in the centuries before that, all the way back. They had no opportunity for salvation. So they figured, hey, the jig is up. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, and bring you into the land of Israel. Now notice the number of times graves. There's twice here. That means they lived once, died, and were buried. Correct? Yes. And you shall know that I am the Lord, which they didn't know in their first life. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I've opened your graves. Number three. O oh, my people, and have brought you up out of your graves. Now notice verse 14. Here's how they're going to be saved. Here is how they're going to be converted. And I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live then they'll live that 100 years and have an opportunity for salvation. And what a fantastic time that will be. Every evil will be undone, annulled, because it says of Satan that Christ came to annul the works of Satan. That is, 
make them as if they never occurred. Now, only God can do that. So you need to think about that and realize that. Okay? And I shall put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land, and you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and have done it, says the Lord. Now, that's quite a fantastic thing indeed, isn't it? Yes, indeed. Okay. So that answers how not only Israel, but all nations will be saved. Now, let's come back here to Revelation 20. See? Now, we remember that before the rest of the dead are resurrected, Satan is removed and cast into the lake of fire with all the demons. Okay? Now, all of those in the second resurrection will have lived one life already under Satan the devil. So they will be able to live just like the people during the millennium. They didn't have to put up with Satan the devil. He will be in the lake of fire in torment. And then as we saw yesterday, his final judgment with the demons is to be in the blackest darkness forever. Okay? Back here to Revelation 20. Now, isn't that an amazing thing that God has done? The greatest work is going to be in the least considered day. It's not even called the last great day until John 7. But it's called the eighth day. And eight is the number of new beginnings. And so this is a new beginning for salvation to all those who will repent and be baptized and grow and overcome during the 100 years. And then those who don't, those who have previously committed the unpardonable sin, will be raised to join the ranks of those who during the great white throne judgment refuse salvation, and they will all be cast into the lake of fire, and they will perish. And it will be as if they never existed because God cannot have an eternal kingdom that is constantly fighting and warring because you cannot work and produce because the greatness of God is yet to be done. From this time forward, with all of these entering into the kingdom of God. So let's read it here. Now then, verse 14, And death and the grave were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And if anyone was not found written in the book of life, he was cast into the lake of fire, all fleshly and burned up. Satan removed. All spirit beings now in the kingdom of God. And this earth is going to be so literally covered with, how's it going to be with all the people on the earth, the spirit being, see? Now remember, the firstborn are going to be in a special category. We will be the ones who will be in New Jerusalem. All the rest that are saved after that will live in spiritual nations on the earth. And what is the work going to be for that? How is that going to be accomplished? Well, that's something God will tell us when we're spirit beings. 
All right, now let's continue on here. Chapter 21. So with that, everything is new. Verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. How did that happen? The lake of fire into which the evil were thrown begins to consume the whole earth. So powerful and so hot, now it doesn't affect us as spirit being, that it's going to evaporate all the oceans. No more sea. Okay? And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice from heaven saying, Behold! The tabernacle of God is with men. And that's the ultimate meaning of the Feast of Tabernacles. And he shall dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And then the time that every human being longs for. Verse 4. And God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall not be any more death. Isn't that amazing? Nor sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, because the former things have passed away. And gone, as if they never existed. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Then he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. They're going to happen, brethren. We're reading of the plan of God that very few grasp and understand, and it is faithful, and it is true, and it's going to come to pass. And he said to me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. The one who thirsts, I will give freely of the fountain of the water of life. And that is continuous spiritual understanding and improvement and living, however that means, see. And the one who overcomes shall inherit all things. And that means the vastness of the universe. And you have to be a spirit being in order to travel in the universe. You can't be flesh and blood. But what is that going to be like? And it's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. So how is that going to work? Well, the only way we can find out is to be there, you see. Okay? All things, and I will be as God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly and the unbelieving, and abominable, and murderers, and fornicators, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death, meaning they have to live twice in the flesh, right? Now these are the ones who will perish. No remembrance of them at all through all eternity. And one of the seven angels that had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues came and spoke to me, saying, Come here, and I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. Now, this is not showing the bride literally, but where the bride will be in New Jerusalem. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and a high mountain and showed me the great city, holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her radiance was like a most precious stone, as crystal clear as jasper stone. Now, as we read this about New Jerusalem, remember what Jesus told his disciples. You believe in God, believe also in me. 
I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I prepare a place for you, I'm coming again to receive you to myself so that where I am, you may also be. This is New Jerusalem, okay? And the city also had a great high wall, 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels, and inscribed upon the gates were the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. And on the east side were three gates, north side three gates, south side three gates, west side three gates, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and written on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Now, this is going to be a fantastic thing indeed. And think about the possibility of us living there in New Jerusalem as the church of the firstborn, the first fruits, forever and ever and ever, down through eternity. So if there is any difficulty or any problem you're having now, get your mind on the final result. And that will diminish it down to a proportion that you can easily handle that problem because your mind is on the completed goal as a spirit being in the kingdom of God. Now verse 16, in this city lies four square. For its length is as long as its breadth. And he measured the city with the rod 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. Then he measured the walls, foundations, all the stones, all the beauty that is there. Now, verse 22. This is going to be something. We will be with God. We will see God as he is. He is our Father and Jesus Christ at his right hand. Now think on that. That's why we were made a little lower than God. For the very purpose of God's plan to have a great and perfect family of spirit beings that love him and Jesus Christ and love each other and all that God has saved and love them and all working together for whatever great plan that God has. And if this is great, think how marvelous it's going to be when all are spirit beings and we can understand exactly what God is doing. Verse 22, And I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun or of the moon. They're still there, but they don't need it that they sh should shine in it because the glory of God enlightens it and the light of it is the Lamb. Magnificent. How much glory of God are we going to be able to see at that time? And the nations that are saved, that's all through the millennium and all in the great white throne 100-year period, shall walk in the light of it and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory and honor to it. Now, what does all of that mean? I don't know. But in order for us to find out, we've got to get there, right? Okay. And the gates shall never be shut by day, for there is no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it, and nothing that defiles shall ever enter it. And there won't be anything to defile anywhere. Okay? Nor shall anyone who practices an abomination or devises a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Quite a wonderful and fantastic thing, brethren. And now let's finish by going through Revelation 22. The capstone of the whole plan of God. Verse 1, 
Then he showed me a pure river of the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing out from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Magnificent. Here's the throne of God and the Lamb and flowing out from underneath it, the river of life. Now, how that works for us as eternal beings, we don't know. But this also means that we're going to be continually learning. And in the middle of the street and on this side and on that side of the river was the tree of life, producing 12 manner of fruit, each month yielding its fruit, and the leaves of the trees are for the healing or the maintenance of the nation. And there shall be no more curse, for the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face. And his name is in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, for they have no need of a lamp or the light of the sun, because the Lord God enlightens them, and they shall reign into the ages of eternity. Now that is something. Eternal life into the ages of eternity. For he said, these words are faithful and true. They're going to happen, brethren, just as God has said. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things that must shortly come to pass, shortly on God's timetable, not ours. Ours is a little different because we're human beings now. So here's the promise. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Now, it's going to be very quickly for all of those in the grave, regardless of when they died, because the next moment of their understanding is going to be they will see Christ. He's here. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Now, you go back and read chapter 1. Blessed are those who read and those who hear the words of the prophecy of this book. Here's the ending of it. Now I, John, was the one who saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who was showing me these things. And he said to me, See that you do not do this, for I am a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book, worship God. Just think of the kind of worship we will have toward God at that time. And our love toward God and God's love toward us. And living in absolute spiritual perfection forever and ever and ever. And keep that focus in your mind. Because all of the difficulties in this life are to be counted as nothing. And at the resurrection, they will be as if they never existed. And he said to me, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, because the time is near. Let the one who is unrighteous be unrighteous still, and let the one who is filthy be filthy still, and let the one who is righteous be righteous still, and let the one who is holy be holy still. Behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to each one according as his work shall be. Coming back down to the earth, now we need to continue to grow and overcome all the time. Verse 13, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who keep his commandments that they may have the right to eat of the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. So all of those who don't keep the commandments of God, 
but think that they're going to attain will not. But excluded are dogs and sorcerers and fornicators and murderers, idolaters, and everyone who loves and devises a lie. I, Jesus. So here we are, brethren, the final salutation before the end of the feast and the last great day. And I, Jesus, sent my angel to testify these things to you in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David the bright and morning star, and the spirit and the bride say, Come! And the one who hears says, Come! Let the one who thirsts come, and let the one who desires to partake of the water of life freely. I jointly testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, that if anyone adds to these things, now this is the seal of the whole Bible. God shall add to him the plagues that are written in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life and from the holy city and from the things that are written in this book. He who testifies these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, Lord Jesus, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And that, brethren, is the meaning of the last great day and the glimpse that God gives to us of all eternity to come as the spiritual sons and daughters of God.